On this episode of Crowdfunding Nerds, we talk about how to find the right marketing agency for you. We talk about sleazy marketing tactics. We talk about the value of different platforms. We even talk about the expense of different advertising services. We cover a lot of ground here. Make sure to listen. Let's get into it. Game begin. Let's go. Go back to the shadow. You shall not fail. Crowdfunding Nerds. Amazing. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another awesome episode of Crowdfunding Nerds. I am your host, Andrew Lohan, and I am joined by Sean this week and no one else, for for no one is good enough. You don't need um, anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Rick is is busy, and it's also early in the morning for him, and, uh, you know, that's it's just common courtesy. So Jacob's AWOL. Yeah, Jacob's AWOL. <laughs> we don't know where Jacob is. Um so uh, this episode, we really wanted to talk about advertising versus marketing. Uh, we got, you know, Sean got in a really interesting conversation with a, uh, a prospective client um, that's been in the game for a long time and in the business for a long time. And um, we just thought that it was interesting enough that we had to share it with you and just kind of discuss it. So, um, Sean, you want to frame the conversation for us? Yeah. So we recently had a conversation with a prospecting client and they was just talking about their current situation in terms of their advertising. They have someone who's running their ads, but they made a statement saying that they've got someone who's doing advertising for them, but he's not marketing. And uh, so that was just a, a very interesting way of putting it. Essentially, they're not very happy with the, the current marketing regime that they have, and they are looking to bring us in so that we can sort of rejuvenate their processes and, and try and get a get their accounts to be profitable. Yeah, I think I think one thing that is really, really common at first, you're just like, hey, I need to market. You know, it's a good idea, but you're not quite sure of all of the, you know, nuances of marketing. But then after you've been spending on ads for, you know, a couple of months, you start to say, okay, how can I make these ads actually or make sure these ads are working? How do I know they're working? Um, are they actually helping me accomplish goals or am I just spending money willy nilly? And I find that more often than not, when we get our best clients, they are experienced with, uh, you know, marketing people that say, Hey, we'll do a great job for you. And they run their ads and maybe they faithfully run their ads, but they, there's really no, um, it's a, I call it pushing a rock. If you, if you've listened to this podcast, I'm sure you've heard that phrase at least once, um, where you are just doing the task. And yes, the task is being done. You know, you're paying me to do the task. So I'm getting it done. And the task is marketing or the task is advertising. And there's no, there's no critical thinking happening on the um, perspective of the, or from the, from the role, from the marketer. And so he, he you know, or she, when it comes time to answer the hard questions, when you're ready to discuss those questions of um, how is our marketing working? What is working well? What is working poorly? How can we optimize this? They don't know the answer. And so, um, in fact, to expand on this, um, Sean, you and I had a conversation with a current client of ours that is um, actually is involved in the games industry for one business, but also has like a, um, an orthopedic uh, website, you know, selling orthopedic supplies um, in, you know, which is a totally different vertical. And we've been working for the orthopedic company. And one of the things that they they shared with us is that they've been working with a marketing agency that is spending about twelve thousand dollars a month in in ad revenue, and they um, are getting a five to one return on their investment, which is actually very good. The problem is that it is that the the they can tell that their marketing company is clearly not confident to scale that number higher, so they're limited now. And, you know, the, the marketing company did a good job, but the, um, the problem is that they are now, you know, stuck. So they either have to find someone else that can, they can make more. I mean, they want to be, you know, instead of, I don't know, $12,000, five to one, that's, that's 60,000 in revenue for $12,000 in ad spend. That's a good number, but they don't want 60,000 in revenue from ads. They want, 600,000 in revenue from ads, 6 million in revenue from ads, and they're never going to get there with this company. So I think another element is that they, they also thought that this particular agency was competent in other areas such as web development and uh, in, in other areas. So they wanted to bring us in where they believe 
their, their perception of us was that we had better competencies and pay per click advertising. Oh, no, sorry, cost mm-hmm. per impression, that's social media advertising. So things like Facebook or uh, Instagram mm-hmm. advertising, which we yeah. do have a lot of experience in, in that vertical. So I think that's mm-hmm. another thing. Not all marketing agencies have the same proficiencies that, that mm-hmm. some sort of specialize in areas. I know that there's certain things that we specialize in is web development, SEO, email marketing, Google ads, uh, Facebook ads. That's basically our, our core competencies. We don't really do too much outside of that. We do a lot of consulting and we point people in other directions. Um, and that's just something that uh, people need to be aware of when they, they come to us is that, you yeah. know, we can do some graphic design for you, but we're not, we're not going to do graphic design for you in terms of right. developing we're not your, design your logo. Page. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we have referrals for that. And I think that's an important concept is, um, I guess the concept is stay in your lane where, you know, whatever you're really good at. I mean, at first, uh, when I was freelancing, I would take money from anywhere because I really needed to feed myself. And then as I, we grew into an agency, um, you know, we we're, you know, we have a half dozen staff now and we can be really good at a few things and we don't need to take on strange work. You know, like if somebody was like, Hey, I really need you to, um, be the project manager for my Kickstarter. I need somebody responding to comments and doing things like that. That's something that we don't do because if we did that, we could make some money in the short term from that one person, but then we're actually not very well set up to, to manage that. So it would be like me personally spending a bunch of my time doing it because I understand how to, you know, talk to people and whatnot. But I, my time is actually much more efficiently spent working on ads and, and, and doing other things. So, um, over time, it, it just makes sense to specialize and to not be all things to all people, uh, which is, you know, I, I, many of you guys know what, um, the game found and Kickstarter are, tr- and, and backer kit are trying to be all things in addition to being a, um, crowdfunding platform. They're trying to be pledge managers. They're trying to be marketing companies. They're trying to be, you know, all the things. And and that's actually, you know, shipping hubs. And I think that's a huge mistake. They're just, they're just saying, you know, Hey, everybody come to us because we'll do everything for you. That's what they want to say. The problem is that they're not going to be very good at doing any of those things. Um, they're going to be, act, you know, actually I'll, I'll rephrase that. They're going to be really, really good at doing a few of those things like backer kit as a pledge manager. They're going to be excellent at that. They've, they've really set themselves up for that. They're trying to become really competent as a, um, crowdfunding platform, but you know, that also they mark, they do marketing and, and, and everything like that. And I, I find that, you know, it just, it's, um, becomes suspect when it, when a company tries to do everything. And so we've made the decision that we don't do everything. And, um, you know, sometimes that means we say no to, to money, um, other, you know, and, I, but I think in the end, everybody's happy. If we can just refer a, a competent graphic designer, a competent project manager that we trust, which by the way, are in short supply. So if you, if you do project management, um, you know, or, or, you know, design Kickstarter pages and that kind of thing, that might be something that we could talk about, um, to, to refer you, but, um, it, it's something that I, I find valuable when you have someone who you can trust as an expert in their field, um, you can also trust that person's referrals. So uh, I guess that's a little bit of a tangent, but hopefully it's it's helpful. So, um, so yeah, you know. Another thing ahead. to bring up, when whenever we have these sort of calls with prospecting clients and they're talking about, oh, we're working with a current agency, we're not too happy. I'm, I always approach this with a, a little bit of trepidation, I'm going to be honest. Because sometimes I think, well, we might not be able to do too much better. They might, you know, plug yeah, us into their systems. This, what's going on? Like, in that oh situation. well, this uh, marketing agency was actually doing a pretty good job, and there's not much more we can do to improve. And this client has very high mm-hmm. expectations, or it could be a problem with the product and and those types of things. But I, I know with one of the clients we met with this week, there was clearly problems with their uh, e-commerce store. It wasn't really set up for sales. I could understand why, even with really good ads they're not making conversions because their mm-hmm. their so sort of website has wasn't really designed or set up correctly, I think, in order to make mm-hmm. conversions profitable with Facebook ads. Another and thing we've to had keep that in mind is that conversation actually, you know, with 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 clients where, you know, when when um when we take on a job, we consider it that you're paying us not to push a rock, but you're paying you know, or do the task. You're paying us to critically think as we're doing the task. So sometimes that means 
hey, these ads are, you know, just before we even get started, ideally, you know, the ads are not going to perform as well as they could if your website stays the way it, you know, it, it currently is. We need to make some serious changes to the website in order to actually stand a chance to be profitable. We could always just give it a go if you've never run ads before. Who knows? Maybe, you know, the game will do well and people will like it and you'll make money and that kind of thing. And then we can up, you know, revamp the the product page or whatever needs to be updated um, like as we go. But there's always that likelihood that you're just going to not. I mean, why spend a boatload of money when you're when you clearly know that major work needs to be done in order to bring your site up to par, you know? Um, in fact, that's actually something we did with Deliverance where we had a nice looking website. We redesigned our website and we we launched it, I want to say in like September. And we had a problem with, uh, you know, we were using a um, a WordPress builder that we commonly use for our landing pages, but with a full on website, you can, I mean, you can make it look really good. The problem is that with that builder and WooCommerce, pages were taking five, six, seven seconds to load. And that's not good. That's not a great e-commerce experience, you know? Um, so, I mean, I think I want to say Amazon for every 0.1 seconds of additional load time, they lose half a billion dollars um, in revenue for their website. So you can imagine what five to seven seconds, I'm sure it's actually an exponential curve where if, if it took five to seven seconds to load a page, Amazon would make no money. Um, mm-hmm. So the uh, or or you know less than half of what they currently make so the um uh what i find is that the um uh the the where where deliverance was short was that load speed and so we actually revamped the website made it i basically gave my my web developer the the instruction to make it exactly like this just don't use that builder you know, and um, so a lot of the creative thought was taken out of the equation and it was like, all right, just get it done. And and it took about a month and we revamped the website and that site loads so fast. That was so important because when we started running ads, you know, we'd have hundreds of people going there every day and, uh, you know, it just, it would have, it would have crashed and burned. We wouldn't have made nearly as much money as we did during the holiday season. You know, we were able to to pull in like a hundred thousand dollars in, in sales, um, during the holidays. And that would not have happened if we stayed with that, that current site, even though it looked good, you know, there were other problems. And it's important to optimize because one thing people need to understand is that uh, when it comes to e-commerce, Facebook ads are expensive and you could be paying anything between uh, five to $20 just for a single sale. So you really want to make sure that everything is as optimized as possible because it costs a lot of money to bring people to your site and to get them to eventually convert and, and make a purchase. Mm-hmm. So you want to make that experience as seamless as possible. And mm-hmm. it's going to ultimately improve the results on the back end and means that you have to spend less to acquire more. And this is really the, the goal of optimizing these things. Another mm-hmm. thing to keep in mind is that sometimes it just requires a strategy change. I know we're working with one client and they were sending, they had a late pledge set up on Indiegogo and it just wasn't really configured well for uh, type Facebook e-commerce sales. So they were having a real, real difficulty getting consistent sales. Hmm. So I suggested, look, you're, you're nearly going to release your products. You get sort of at the end of your pledge manager. Why don't we switch to email capture and we would just capture emails and then we can announce when the product is actually live. So we did that. We, quickly developed a, a landing page using MailChimp. So we didn't, it didn't even uh, take that long um, and uploaded some images and ran ads that are capturing emails. And they're, they're getting leads at such a good price, like under a dollar per lead. Uh, Cause they got some really nice visuals and it's just, I think the, the, the products framed nicely mm-hmm. and they're just basically building up, ramping out now for this huge launch um, of their, of their website. And so there's an example of where something wasn't working and then understanding that or well, changing strategies might be a better way. And I've, I've noticed that with Facebook mm-hmm. as well, is that sometimes using Facebook as a great way to obtain prospects and then using something like email marketing to then convert them is, is better. It's something to do with buyer behavior on Facebook. People's mm-hmm. buyer intent is quite low. So you sort of have to warm them up before kind of getting a, a conversion. And so email capture is a great way, a great system to use Facebook ads. So I'm pretty confident that when they, when they launch, that they're going to 
uh, see a lot of conversions. But another thing that's allowed us to do is that we, we've now been able to test a whole bunch of audiences that we wouldn't really, because now we're, we have different KPIs to capture emails. And we're able to see which demographics are moving the needle more so that when they eventually do launch their store, we'll have all this data, all this information on which de- demographics, which interests, which targeting has produced the most emails and will likely then produce uh, more purchases uh, later down the road. So it's, it's been helpful in that way to sort of strategize for the launch of the, the website down the road. Yeah, and, and that reminds me of something that uh, we dealt with early on where we actually had a, a client that had a, a product that made you know high six figures, very high six figures in their crowdfunding campaign that was clearly in high demand and the website was good. We w- we sent people to the site using Facebook ads. We targeted correctly. We were looking at the ads and we were just not making the sales that we had hoped we were we would make. And um, so rather than saying, okay, let's let's you know dial down the the cost per click. Let's make sure that cost per click is as low as possible. And that's not a bad thing to do, but it's it's actually not addressing the problem. the The problem is related to, well, we're sending people there and they're not buying. So whether the cost per click is 40 cents or 20 cents or 10 cents, um, we're getting buyers at like a hundred dollars or a a click or a hundred dollars a conversion. So uh, for a, for a $90 product or whatever. So if we just, you know, cut the cost per click in half, it would still be $50 to get a $90 sale, which is, which is not good. Like we, we have a, a clearly a, a significant problem. Um, and it actually ended up not being related to the website at all. And uh, we've talked about this in, in the past, but um, this particular client had, uh, you know, sold lots of games into distribution. Those games were all purchased by, well, many, many of them were enough of them to be a problem. We'll put it that way. Were purchased by deep discounters that were selling on Amazon. So while we were uh, selling a product for $90 on the uh, client's website, that also cost, you know, charge shipping. Um, these deep discounters were selling for like $75 on Amazon Prime. So, you know, which is free shipping for anybody that has a Prime account. And so what we were doing, what I noticed was that we were selling for that Amazon person. So they were buying the product at, you know, whatever it was, retail cost. And then they were deep discounting because they were just a an internet discounter. And they were leveraging the fact that we were, you know, spending whatever it was, lots, lots of money, you know, over a hundred bucks a day on, on ads and sell, you know, what a customer, customers are smart. They're going to get the best price for, for an item and, you know, buy in the most convenient way for them. So they, um, would go to the website, see the product, say, wow, this looks really interesting. And then what they do is they Google it and look for the best price and everybody's finding that Amazon listing or, or of course they can look on Amazon directly as well. And they're buying that. So we saw those people go from 100 units down to like 10 and then re-up their their stock because it was selling very well. And um, that's where all the conversions were going. So in some cases, it actually has nothing to do with the website. It has everything to do with the overall strategy. And we were able to sniff that out. And it, it ended up that, you know, we just had to stop the the advertising because there was um, there was no... There wasn't going to be a sh- in in the short term. There wasn't a solution to that. You know, we had to, uh, you know, our client had to kind of work through what they were doing and figure out a, a different route forward. And um, which I which I think that they've done. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's that's something that you know you might want to also consider. Just throwing throwing money down the drain is something you know. Marketing will take all the money that you have. It, you know, if you have a hundred bucks a day, if you have ten dollars a day. If you have a thousand dollars a day marketing, we'll take all of that money. The key is in making sure that you made more than you spent uh, by enough of a margin that you don't go out of business. So, or don't you know waste a bunch of money and 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 not understand where where it went or why. So um, maybe that's yeah, a good and, segue. And for like Amazon, you really want to make sure you have a map set in place. I know Jack Dunbar has been on the podcast before, and he's spoken about this. How you can, yep. um, but. Then you also sort of need the the legal. Mm-hmm. You need to, be to enforce registered. it. Yeah, yeah. You still got yes. to, and you have to be willing to send sort of uh, 
not so friendly letters to people saying, Hey, cut that out. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think that, you know, nowadays I feel that every board game company, every, you know, publisher needs to have a, um, a strategy that sells direct to customers. I mm-hmm. think, you know, what I find is that many customer or many companies that are established are selling into distribution. This is kind of the classic model, we'll say, where you make a product, you you sell to early adopters on Kickstarter or like Stonemaier Games or other companies like that will do pre-orders directly on their website and you um and then you sell the the remaining stock into distribution where distributors sell to retailers and you're going to make a small piece of that but you're going to sell many um many more than um than you would direct so a lot of the time the emphasis is on selling to distribution which is like the land of milk and honey for for every publisher but what i'm seeing is that nowadays you know I mean, you know, th- those publishers will oftentimes have, you know, t- unless unless you're again doing, uh, s- you know, pre-sales on your site, like, you know, um, Stonemaier Games does or whatever, you're going to make typically less than 10% of your revenue from selling direct. A lot of the time, you're going to make money through selling. Uh, maybe maybe on I don't know if I could count Amazon in selling direct unless you were the one that dominated Amazon for your product. But uh, a lot of the time, that money is being uh, earned through distribution and earned through Kickstarter, which I'm going to separate out. So let's let's separate out pre-sales and just say, okay, you've got a product. Now you need to sell it. Um, how are you going to sell it? And I think that direct is one of the main areas that companies are going to start to see uh, meaningful revenue increases if they really find a way to focus on that direct sales. Um, you know, I think you should have a direct sales channel that's 20, 30, 40% of what it is that you uh, currently make. And um, because really bottom line is you need to be the one to drive your sales. You need to be the one to drive interest so that distribution wants to pick you up, that retailers want to buy your, your products and, and that sort of thing. And if, if there's, if, you know, distribution will receive your products, but they're not going to go above and beyond to sell your products. If other products are selling, they're just going to buy less or maybe not, buy from you next time if your products don't sell. There has to be demand out there that you are responsible for creating in the end as the as the CEO or the brain behind your your company. You're the one that's responsible for making sure that your company survives, succeeds, thrives and all all of that. So, um I know we were recently talking yeah. to Gray Fox Games and one of their strategy was when they go to Kickstarter, they they only sell uh, to retailers the core games, but then all their expansions and then any bells and whistles. Right, like in the terms retail of version of the game versus the deluxe version of the game, right? Yes. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if you want to get the expansion, if you want to get the improved components, you have to go to their website and order from them directly. And I think that's, that's a pretty good strategy where you're sort of hitting both. You're kind of getting your name out there in terms of mm-hmm. distribution and seeing your games and sort of local friendly game stores. But then you're also giving people a reason to go to mm-hmm. your store and pick up your expanded edition and uh, particularly if they're they're fans of the series and they, they want all the things then yep. you, know, you can very easily just put your website uh, in your rule book and get people to say hey the expansion is like lego does this right my, my son got a bunch of lego for christmas and like he now is hounding me because in this little lego present he's got all these advertisements of lego and he's like i want this for my birthday and i want this and i want that it's like yep. okay well there we go there the ad works so i think Publishers need to do this. Like, and the, like the last page of your rule book should be a big ad of all your other stuff yeah. that you, that you offer. Say, Hey, go to our website and pick all these things up. Yeah. A lot of the time people have inserts in their, in their boxes that advertise their other games. Also, um, I've seen companies use the sides of their box, uh, like the inside of their box. Uh, so the box bottom, the inside cover, uh, or well, I don't know. Anyway, you guys know the box bottom, the side, the side walls on the, the external side walls of the box bottom. There you go. I did it. Um, <laughs> each one uh, advertises a different product. And I think that that's a clever way to kind of, um, share more and try to kind of increase your share of customer. I guess if a customer buys one product from you, um, that's good. But if they buy two, then that's way better. So, um, to clarify for, for myself and, and, and those listening, what you're kind of getting at, Sean, is that um, by going from one 
marketing person to another or one marketing agency to another, it might not fix the problem. Correct. Yes. And, and each agency has different competencies. So it might be that doing an okay job, you might find more success elsewhere, but it could also just mean that they already have maximized your processes and changing agency might not necessarily produce better results. Mm-hmm. So I think that the key in, in the end, the key is to understand why, why it happened. Um, you know, I, we did an episode a little while back on the scientific method as it applies to marketing. And that's how my brain works. When I analyze something, it's always using the scientific method, uh, make a hypothesis, experiment and, and test and measure and observe and, and, you know, all of those steps and then draw conclusions as to why, you know, uh, very importantly, eliminating variables is a huge component. Like why did something happen? Is it, um, because of X or because of Y or do we have enough information to tell? And how can we gain said information to um, to make those conclusions? I think that that personally is the greatest value of a good marketing partner is they should be able to identify why, or they should be able to put a, a path together to figure out why. And I think that, um, you know, as I, we, we were talking with, uh, you know, in a client meeting, you and I together, we were talking in a client meeting about um, how we work and how we diagnose problems and that kind of thing. And I told our um, this uh, prospective client that we don't um, we don't like to portray ourselves as the experts and say, oh, you must do what I say because I'm the expert. Um, in many cases, the way that they operate their business is different than the way that any client we've ever had before operates their business. There's some custom elements and, and the, the assets they have uh, are doing different things and the audience that they have are different people and um, they respond in different ways. And so I told them, you know, at first we're going to operate on general principles that, that work, but we're going to learn about your clients and the way that your clients respond are going to be different. And the problems that we encounter as a result are going to be different. And we won't always have the answer as to like, what's going on. We're not just going to be able to be like, oh yeah, this is the problem. Um, that's a hypothesis that needs to be, you know, tested and measured and, and, and so on. Right. But, um, what I did say is that, and I think we're going to, um, we're, we're going to get this client for sure. Um, but I said that if we do not know the answer. We will outline a plan to go find the answer and we'll keep you informed at, you know, every step of the way. I mean, that's, that's, I think the most that you could ask. And of course, the more knowledgeable, the more um, experienced a, a marketing company is, the more that they've done that and the more likely it is that they've gone through that experience already and can say, oh yes, you know, why isn't your Facebook account connecting or why is your pixel not working correctly? Or why is this, why is this ad performing poorly? They, they should have a lot of wisdom to say, ah, yes, you forgot to include a link to your website or whatever, you know, that, that type (laughs) of thing should be pretty quick. Right. And um, so I I just find that guaranteeing that I'm going to have the answer 100% of the time is a fool's errand. And, you know, that we, we try to kind of take that, that shield away so that you can actually see what's going on behind the scenes if, if you want to. Um, because, you know, in the end, we're just, we're humans trying to kind of figure this out together. And our, our perspective mm-hmm. as a marketing company is that we're not working for our clients. We're working with our clients that we're kind of in, in the marketing, um, seat in their company. It's our job to help. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we have to have the answers all the time, but it does mean that, when there's a problem that we're responsible for figuring out what it is, you know, in the marketing arena. Yeah. And, and very often our clients understand their products far better than we do. Um, so offering suggestions of how, have you tried this or, you know, focusing on this element of the game? Like, oh no, I haven't. Cause I wasn't really even sure that was an element of the game. So I think offering suggestions is certainly always a very welcome and, and, and should be as well. And I, I do like mm-hmm. this idea of working with your marketing agency. And I think this is where scale comes, comes, into mind because I think some marketing agencies probably can't offer this as a service mm-hmm. because they've taken on too much. And it's a danger that we run into as well. And we've, we've got very sort of strict rules on how many accounts we can take on at any given time. Yep. Our, our pricing structure actually 
varies depending on how many active clients we have, because the reality is we can't give this type of attention to accounts if we have so many right. accounts that we, uh, we just don't have yep. the time to actually do these type of deep dive troubleshooting. Um, it's yep. fine. It's great when everything's working smoothly and you don't need to do this type of troubleshooting. Then you can take as many accounts as you like. But when you do face issues and you do have to meet and sort of troubleshoot, then it really does start slowing things down. So that's something to keep right. in mind as well is, and I think it might be a danger that all marketing agencies can get into is, is scale. It's taking on too many clients, uh, taking on too much they can choose. That's just something that we're sort of in, in the process internally talking about. Should we hire more staff uh, to come in? Because at, right now we're, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty busy, which is a good complaint right. to have, but we don't, we want to make sure that our quality of service isn't impeded by our ability mm -hmm. because we've taken on too yeah. many clients. We've, we've right. promised too much. In fact, actually, you know, one of the meetings that we had uh, this week came about after, um, so they, they originally asked me to take over their ad campaign uh, in November, and I told them I could not do it. It, it. it was earlier than that. It was like October or September. You know, we, we earned them as a, as a client for SEO marketing, and they were like, hey, take our, take our ads on too. And my wife is like eight and a half months pregnant, and it's like, this is a pretty big client, and it's like, you know, I feel like I am going to do a bad job with this um, to uh, kind of go, off, you know, to expose the humanity in, in our company. I, I told them, no, we can't take you on right now and that you're going to have to work with, you know, the, the company or your current company or you're going to have to find another agency to to do your paid ads because if we took you on, it would be a lot of work for us. And I personally have to be involved in a lot of the you know, uh, Google ads and um, other things like that, you know, just to onboard a big client, it's going to require time from me. And so I told them we couldn't do it. We're just not in a place where we're, where we're, we would be able to do that. My wife is too pregnant. And also, you know, October, November, December, that's when deliverance was releasing. And I knew that it would be a crazy amount of attention required for me. And um, so I just, I told them that we couldn't take them on. And, um, and you know, my hands are tied. Jake, Jacob hands are tied. So it's not like there's mm -hmm. other staff that can jump in and take on a, a larger account. Right. And so I, but I did say, we want to take you on. We just can't do it right now. And they, they said, okay. And then, you know, they're working with uh, Rick, Rick on the uh, SEO side and they're really happy with him. He's doing a really great job. And, and in one of their meetings, they were like, Hey, is, is Andrew free now? Can he take on, you know, work now? And it just so happened to be the, the week that I, you know, my, my baby's like eight weeks old and, and things are much more stable and I'm back full time now. And Rick was like, yeah, he can, you know, and, and so we connected and, um, I think that that in, in the end, it was something that they appreciated that they, they were like, Hey, if, if Andrew's going to take us on, it's because he's able to do it now. And it, it gave more, um, credit to, to, you know, just, I don't know, we, we were honest about what our, our capacity was, you know, and, um, it made them very confident in in our ability to do the work, you know, uh, when they came back. But you know, we we risked losing that client as a as a potential source of revenue. But in the end, I think that it's it's a bigger mistake to get two three months down the road and underperform for a client and hurt our reputation. But we made a little bit of money. But you know, it's it's you know, we did a bad job for people, and I, I think it's that's a worse scenario than just not taking on the the work. You know? Yeah, I think, and trust is a huge issue when it comes to, or trust is a key component of any, of taking on any marketing agency because I suppose anyone can sort of hoodwink someone and, you know, mm -hmm. promise the world and then like, oh, sorry, well, it didn't work out. And well, we got your yeah. money now. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I know that we, I've been on sort of prospecting calls with uh, clients and I've definitely lost the, the, the lead or lost the, the deal because I've just been honest and saying, look, this is, this is the uh, results we tend to see with this type of product. And you can just see the blood drain from their face. They're not happy with that. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to, you know, flatter you or, or promise something that, you know, I say, this is the typical results that we see. And it might be different for you. Uh, what, what we can guarantee is that we work hard and this is, we have a proven process, but I, I can't guarantee that you're going to hit a certain, you know, result. Uh, but yeah. what I can promise is that we will work hard with you and we will, we will troubleshoot. 
And then that, that some people are fine with that. Some people are not. They want to, you know, they kind of want guarantees. And some people, they, I, I think they kind of want you to fawn over their product and say, Oh, it's mm-hmm. so amazing. What a great idea. Of course, this will sell. <laughs> and it's like, I'm not going to, and I'm not going to flatter you either. I'm not going to tell you right. something that you want to hear. I want to, I want to try to be balanced and almost yeah. objective because I think one interesting thing about bringing in a market, marketing agency is that they've got no touch points with your product. They, in, in a way, they can look at what you're doing with fresh eyes and they can see it from a different perspective. And I think that's very important that they able, they're able to apply this sort of uh, mm-hmm. apprehension, I suppose, to, to what you're doing uh, without any kind of previous emotions Im- right. Im- impacting that decision process so that mm-hmm. they can use your information, which you're very close to your product, but then they can also bring in their own and say, well, actually you need to kind of reword this or approach it from a different angle because this is how it could be perceived from someone who doesn't have all the extensive background information that you have. And you're just assuming uh, in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that it is to our client's benefit when we do not fawn over the product. Now, I I, uh, I will say that there are many products that we market that I do fawn over. Um, one of them being uh, like the Isofarian Guard. One of my favorite, favorite games, you know, playing cooperative with my wife. Um, uh, make sure you only buy it if you have like a six foot wide table because it's big. Um, so the, uh, I, I mean, technically playing surface is like four foot by three foot is what's required, but you're going to have, you know, other chairs or the floor filled with pro- with things, you know, to, you know, the, the actual playing surface is not the actual, the storage surface required. But uh, anyway, so um, there are other products that I think are really, really amazing. And sometimes I see a product I think is amazing. And it just turns out that I'm a fan of that particular type of game. And it doesn't really resonate with a huge group of people. But I love, you know, like, uh, for example, I love um, fast solo games that are really interesting. So Gabe Barrett's Hunted campaign that's rolling right now on GameFound is something that personally really interests me. Um, and that's, but that's not the wide market necessarily. You know, solo is fast growing and everything, but it's not something that is uh, generally adopted by the masses yet. So um, it's important to keep that, the fanboyism in check, you mm-hmm. know, for us and just give an objective look. One, one thing that I've always been inspired by is uh, actually Jeff Probst from Survivor. Jeff Probst is the host of Survivor, and I was listening one time to a podcast with, um, gosh, Elon Elon Lee and um, Justin Gary on on Justin's podcast, Think Like a Game Designer, and uh, both of them, I believe, have worked with um, Jeff Probst on Survivor, and Jeff has, it, which Survivor is like forty plus seasons now. It's it's just it's wild. it feels like it's it's survived past you know, longer than the Simpsons or something. Um, but the, he's, the he's thing been in that, the Zimmer frame. So like, yeah. you've been eliminated. <laughs> the tribe has voted you out. <laughs> Seriously. So, yeah. So the, the thing that they both said that I found amazing was that Jeff Probst is a game designer. So he is a game designer. There are lots of games on survivor that are, that have to be interesting and whatnot. So he'll come up with this game and then he will, t- it's almost like, there, there. He has this superpower. They said, is that he will forget that he was the designer of that game, and he will look at it from an like an unbiased perspective. It's this, this like he saw it for the very first time. All of a sudden, it's like he's a different human, and he looks and and identifies the problems with it, and eliminates a lot of his own games that he makes with the you know with like in in the middle of this like big collaborative effort of everybody working together. It's it's like. Something that I've heard, I guess it doesn't sound that amazing when I, when I say it out loud, but that show has been alive for over 40 seasons because of Jeff Probst. And it is interesting every season because of Jeff and his superpower. And he is now, you know, a very wealthy human. Um, but I think it's because of that superpower. So, um, I, th- I just thought he was the presenter. I didn't know he was actually involved in like, crafting the games. Well, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, so it's it's uh it's pretty interesting. I mean, it's a uh, very um there's there's a lot of depth there if it it would be a good uh, case study one day. So, maybe we can move into something that is super related, but it's kind of this conversation of like we we addressed it in the beginning a little bit, but advertising versus marketing and then related is like being sleazy 
versus being not sleazy. You know, there, there are a lot of people listening to this podcast that are introverts and introverts look at extroversion as a superpower sometimes. And I find that sometimes introverted people, in fact, I had a conversation with a, with a good friend of mine this week about this, where, where he was like, you know, I just feel like a, a sleazy salesperson and trying to try to sell somebody with marketing. And I never feel good about writing ads and talking about my products and other things like that. It's just really hard for him to do. And so um, maybe we could start out with like this, this concept of like advertising versus marketing. And then we could talk about that, that sleazy used car salesman feeling. Yeah. Well, I think advertising is something that like billboards do. It's like a billboard company. Or well, Facebook does. Facebook is an advertiser. You pay them money and they display your ad and they don't really care if it's successful or not. They just, they're with the platform where this is where you advertise. Whilst a marketer, I think is, well, we want to advertise, but we want to do so in a way that's going to be beneficial to your business, to your company. So I think that's, that's where the distinction is. Yeah. There's certain groups or maybe even some marketers who kind of have this approach. Well, I did the thing. I pushed the buttons. I got your ad seen. Uh, but then there's also needs to be the sort of troubleshooting and, and problem solving and optimization, which is what the agency should do is what the marketer should do. And a lot of this comes down to understanding demographics, understanding the, the core values of the product and how to position that, how to word it, uh, understanding sort of psychology of human behavior, frankly, and how people on certain platforms act and why they're there. Like a lot of it is just putting yourselves in the shoes of someone and mm-hmm. trying to work out their emotional state and experience. It's actually something I'm, I'm currently looking into is yeah. the personality assessment system called PAS. It was actually used by the CIA, uh, <laughs> developed by the CIA. Uh, this, and it comes from the 80s of just basically um, breaking people up into different person personality spheres. And then from that, making sort of uh, bringing about certain implications of their behavior. Uh, so it's something I'm, I'm researching, I'm looking into, because I'm thinking, well, if it, this might be interesting in a marketing sense where you have different personalities who gravitate to different things. And it gives, let's take deliverance as an example. There might be people who are just really interested in solo. And if you can kind of glean them out of the deliverance community, then you can direct solo messaging or a particular messaging that's going to be more mm-hmm. beneficial to them. It's going to help them more. Or you find some people who just really love the theme and they don't really care about the game mechanics too much. Well, then you can start tailoring your message to them in a way that emphasizes the themes. So understanding their personalities and what's driving them, what's motivating them. I think it's important to understand your demographics in that kind of detail so that you can have this nuance in your messaging. And this is where email marketing is sort of ideal for this type of thing where you can segment your audiences. And But that only comes down to understanding your customers and then also understanding uh, personality types and these types of things. But I'll, I think yeah. overall, my overall point is understanding your customer is key to a marketer. And, uh, and this is why we've specialized in gaming, right? We don't market... We have market a bunch of other things, but a lot of people come to us because they want us to market games. And that's because we are gamers ourselves. We were all gamers before we were marketers. Um, I think we have a general understanding of what the industry is like and what people are wanting and what works as well. So I think we've been able to carve this niche within uh, the marketing sphere because we understand uh, this demographic of people. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and also nobody does marketing better than the CIA. (laughs) <laughs> um so actually there's a, there's a book that that you made me think about it's called um the purple cow by seth godin um seth godin is is an excellent marketing mind and somebody in fact i think he has like a daily blog that he will send via email and sometimes it's only like one sentence but every single you know thing that he writes is is uh, thought provoking and so he has a book called the purple cow that pre- presents basically so the, the concept is that if you're driving, you know, if, I don't know if you're in Kansas and you're driving um, down the road and you see a bunch of cows grazing um, off to your left and one of them is purple, the only cow that you're going to look at the entire time is the purple cow. And so the concept is that creative advertising um is less effective today because of clutter and people not wanting to like they, they generally people like to avoid getting advertised to. So when your product stands out, that is going to make people look. And so the idea is that, you know, you need to produce remarkable products, number one, but number two, 
you need to target people who are likely to spread uh, the word of mouth about the product. And, you know, for, for us, like whenever we take on a new client, I need to have answers to three questions. Um, who, you know, what, uh, I need to know what your product is and that kind of thing, but I really need to know who your customer is, where they congregate. And what I say to them in order to convince, in order to like convince them to take a look. So, um, you, you know, like Sean was saying, you, you have to divide your customers into different groups. Like, what are they interested in? Why did they, why did they look to follow me at, you know, via email or why are they in my social community or why did they buy this game? You know, and they'll tell you if you ask them and they'll fall into various groups. You know, for me, I've got, um, people that for, for deliverance, we've got people that absolutely love the gameplay and how it's super dynamic and you can replay it a hundred times and it feels, it actually feels excellent and challenging each time and, and whatnot. It's got multiple difficulty levels. Then people can jump into that really punishing difficulty or whatever. And then you have other people that are like, I just, I just like to play cooperative games with my family that are hard to you know, that, that like that quarterbacking problem that's so common in gaming in cooperative gaming is where one person is telling you what to do. Um, that that is minimized in deliverance. And there are people that, that really love that. And other people really, really love the theme and what we're trying to do and the fact that it's a, a Christian product. And that's they're they're something that is good enough that they can actually hang their hat on and show people that's what they like most about it. And then other people, you know, are just straight up non-Christians that, love the fact they can explore the theme and that it's it's like a safe way to explore um the uh you know the lore of the bible and that you know that kind of thing and it's just very interesting so we have lots of different groups of people and we don't we can't really talk to them all the same you know and that's that's mm-hmm. a, a major thing and it's like so the the purple cow is is a, a great book to to read for those that are interested in diving deeper into that but um it's definitely something that um i i would recommend and i think another one thing that you, that way at least and one thing that you learned Andrew, i think was to kind of step back and allow people to come to their own conclusions as well i, I yes. do think there's a tendency in and for marketers to try too hard mm-hmm. I, this is actually something we've been thinking about i've recently finished a book with my my wife uh, by David Wilkerson is called The Cross and the Switchblade, if you're familiar with it. Uh, no. But it's about this um, minister who goes to sort of New York and, and tries to have inroads into street gangs. And uh, he's having, he's having no success with this. And uh, one of these, these kind of street kids who's in a gang saying <laughs> is telling him he's trying too hard. And I like, guess really, really, uh, impacted him and changed. And he eventually developed teen, teen challenge. And, um, that sort of helped a lot of youths in, in New York, but it was just, it was quite interesting that an outsider with sort of no, uh, understanding the things that he was trying to do was just could, could see he was trying too hard. And I, I do think that that's an element where people can also try too hard. And I, you often see this mm-hmm. with like game designers. They, they kind of yeah. like, uh, they talk too much like game designers, like this game has this revolutionary mechanic and you could do this, 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 and this. Yeah. Like, I don't, like, I don't think people are going to read that wall Never of text before to be seen. honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or it's just like, it's so descriptive that no one's going to read that. You know, you just kind of need to say like in a sentence what it is. And that's, that's probably yep. enough. That's, and then oftentimes we, we do find within the advertising, the mm-hmm. simpler your messaging is and just the more kind of on point <laughs> it is. The, yeah. yeah. Specific. It, it, it does, does the best. Specific is terrific. Yeah. And you know, a lot of the people are very afraid to, to say, you know, like my game is great. If you love cooperative games, my game, you would love it. If you don't like cooperative games, then try it anyway. You know, it's, it's, um, you might change your mind. It's like, no, just like say, if you don't like cooperative games, you won't like this. Like what's, what's wrong with that? Um, you're, and, and that, that's kind of, you know, brings me into this concept of like the sleazy marketing guy, you know, like if you feel like, you know, some people, listening to this podcast won't feel like this. Well, they won't feel sleazy or anything, but they're making the same mistake. Um, when you tell somebody what your product is and they decide that they don't like it or that they're not going to buy it, that's not a bad thing. Um, I will say, you know, actually I'll address what you said is that um, when I, with deliverance in particular, if I would tell people about the game, you know, like it's a, let's say a, Christian person is coming is coming up to the booth and I'm like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, oh yeah, I saw this and I find out they're a Christian and I'm like, hey, this game 
is theologically sound for a fantasy. It's kind of like Narnia. And then they say, oh, I don't really like Narnia. <laughs> you know, <laughs> then I just talked myself out of a sale, but I didn't even know anything about them. I'm just as aside from the fact that I, you know, I saw you were wearing a cross necklace or whatever, you know, did you know? And that is not a good way to, to sell anything, first of all. Um, and you want to, you want to just present your product and let them draw conclusions, tell them about the product. So just uh, for me, you know, I, I tell them about the theme, who you are, what the kind of the, 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 a little bit about the story and kind of how, how the game plays. And if they're still interested, then they're welcome to ask questions or we can do a demo. And by the time they experience the product, they are able to draw their own conclusions and say, you know, maybe that very same person was like, oh, I was really, really looking for an awesome cooperative game where I could just slay stuff as an angel. And that's why I was really excited. Um, and so that's the thing that I should talk about. It's like, why? Well, yes, that is exactly what happens in this game. And you're able to just, so the, the, the main point here I want to drive home is that you can help somebody find what it is that they want. And that thing may very well be your product. And when you help them find the thing that they want that happens to be your product, that, you know, them buying it is like, you're actually doing them a favor, you know, because they, that's like the perfect experience for them. And so I think that it's, uh, you know, that, that for me, the difference between being sleazy and, uh, and not is, uh, sleazy people try to convince others to buy helpful people that are, mm. that are marketers help people find what it is that they want. And I'm not going to try to, you know, in implant ideas into your head. Like, don't you wish there was a cooperative game you could play where you could play angels fighting demons. You know, it's like, that's not a very, <laughs> that's a very sleazy way to talk. You know, it's like, um, you know, like, wouldn't, don't you wish there's a board game that could get you points with Jesus so that you get a better house in heaven. You know, when you go there, it's like, that's, I feel like Brian Regan. I'm talking like the comedian, but um, it's that's a terrible way to sell. So you know, it's it's much better to say, you know, like hi, welcome. This is Deliverance is a game about this, and you know, and they're 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 at your booth or they're looking at your ad and they clicked on it for a reason. Just give them a little bit of information and let them decide what they want to consume from from that point on. Right? Yeah. I think another way of thinking of it, which I find quite helpful is, let's say that you have a friend that comes to your house and they're standing in front of your board game collection. I know, Andrew, right now I can see behind <laughs> you, you've got all your games. But what would you say to convince me to play one of those games with you? And that's usually a good starting point is that you're not going to say, oh, this is a two to five cooperative game. It takes approximately <laughs> 45 minutes to play. No, you're going to say, oh yeah, this game, Terraforming this game Mars. This has infinite replayability. Imagine this game a, is revolutionary. Imagine a world in which a corporation <laughs> owns everything. He's commissioned you to go to Mars and there's all these different coins. That's how you're going to explain yeah. it. It's like, will we, will we terraform Mars? I don't know. Yeah. Let's try. Yeah, That's I, how you're going to actually... explain it. You're not, you're not going to explain it in like this robot voice in terms of almost kind of like put yourself as like a game master trying to like convince your friends to play certain games and that's probably a good place to start like how how yep. do, would you convince your friend to play yep. one of the games on your shelf and that's how you probably should be talking about your game in terms of marketing yeah in fact i actually uh just set up a game night um for like a week from friday and uh with friends that we don't normally game with but really want to see and um inspired by the the sean the sean um you know, inviting people into your house challenge. Gosh, yeah, uh, we've still got to do that because it's like the seventeenth. <laughs> we haven't got anything planned. <laughs> oh snap! I've I've got a I've got a family coming in tomorrow, and then another family coming in uh, next. You're beating next me Friday, my own so. challenge. I'm ahead of you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you inspired me. So uh, the uh, you know everyone's like, yeah, I'd be free for a game night, and then and then I text. I said the only question is, do we slay demons? Do we venture through the forest and create houses as cute animal critters? Do we battle for supremacy in an epic space opera or settle the frontier? Um, you know, and yeah. that was, that was what I asked. And it was, you know, it's kind of a fun way to, to say like, I mean, do you want to play a game like Catan? Do you want to play a game like, you know, I don't know, Moonrakers? Do you want to deliverance? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and it's, it should be a lot of fun. Right. But that's, I, I think that the, you know, when, when you're a um, kind of getting, in the mindset of, uh, of a marketer with your own product, you're so close to the trees that you can't see the forest. Um, or maybe, it, maybe it's vice versa. Like you're too close to the forest to see the trees. Uh, I don't remember how the analogy goes, but 
But basically, you know everything about your product. The problem is you're not sure what to say. You know, you know too many things and you're not sure what what's the one thing that I should say about this. And so I find that it's it's far better to ask, you know, to ask your your customers like what what makes you like this and and kind of lean lean into that. So um the Andrew Yeah. Sorry to <laughs> cut Go you ahead, off. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can tell folks can you relate What's the most sort of sleazy experience you've had of like selling, trying to sell you, like do the hard sell? Do you have oh. any experiences like that? Because I, one comes to my yeah. mind, I, I could share, but I don't know if you have any. I'm sure you uh-huh. have um, of someone just doing the hard sell. And this, this just really yeah. puts you if off. If somebody calls me again about like the solar tax credit, I'm going to go crazy. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, hello, sir. Have you experienced or have you, I do you have solar on your house, the California solar tax credit. It's like, you know, I live in Texas, bro. Um, but that, that happens on the regular still. So, but I'll, I'll say, I'll say this. There was a, there was a guy one time. So we have a big family. I have seven children. And so normal cars don't work, you know, like normal cars that work mm-hmm. for everyone else, like minivans and whatever, just don't work for us. We needed a big one. And so we decided, uh, you know, we were everybody when, you know, you're looking for a car, you're going to look online and figure out like, does this one fit? What about that one? What, but what about the cost? Here's my price range and this and that. And so we kind of settled on um, a car that we wanted, which was the Ford Transit uh, 350. It's a Ford Transit passenger wagon is what it's called. And it seats like 15 people. Um, And that's the one we wanted because you can take the back seats out and it's got storage space and whatnot, but it's got a lot of seats because I don't know how many kids I'm going to have. Like, I just want to know that I have some extra seats. If I got a car to have, yeah, seriously. Like if I, at the time we had five kids and we were having a, you know, the sixth was on the way. I could have had, I could have purchased a car that had eight seats in it, but I'm like, you know, I, I haven't figured out how to stop having children yet. I should probably <laughs> bank on Good having God. more. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, what we did was we, um, you know, did all our research and figured out, okay, the Ford Transit's the one we want. And there was this used car salesman that I knew and, uh, you know, he doesn't listen to the podcast or anything, but I, I don't want to say his name or anything like that either. That was trying to convince me to get a Ford Sprinter or no, no, no. What is it? A Mercedes Sprinter van. And I'm like, I, I just don't trust the Mercedes Sprinter. It looks like it's going to fall over. It's just so tall that like, wouldn't it just get tipped over in the wind? Like if you turn too sharply, would it, would it, would you flip, you know? And I just told him like, I'm not really interested in that car, but he was trying to convince me to get that car. Why? Because he owned a used car dealership that sold Sprinter vans. And he would be able to sell me. If he convinced me to buy a Sprinter, he would be able to sell me. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying, like, if you really think that something is awesome, like, hey, have you considered the Sprinter? I sell the Sprinter and I think it's awesome. And here's why. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you're trying to, like, make a sale, uh, you know, like, there's a difference between giving advice and, and, and saying like, Hey, I think you should consider this. And I would say, thank you. And if I wanted that sprinter van, I would have gone to him, but I, I didn't. And I think it kind of hurt his feelings that he, uh, you know, that I had whatever it was, it was like $20,000 to buy, which by the way, this was like before the 2020 pandemic, the car that cost me $28,000, um, was worth like $70,000 after, you know, like three years later, because there were none of them being produced. And, um, so it was, it was like a ridiculously wild situation. I'm like, wow, I could make money. And then all of a sudden I just, I guess we'll have to walk everywhere. (laughs) You know, it's like, what what am I going to do? It's like invisible money. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, kind of that, that story. So I find the sleaziest sales experience is kind of that, that used car salesman that when you go to the lot, that's their chance to sell you. They're going to, they're treating you like a wallet and you know, they, they're just trying to convince you to buy something that's on their lot and they're going to do whatever they can to sell you. Because if you leave the lot without buying something, then they've lost the opportunity to make money from you. So they're, they're going to try to convince you, you know, Oh yeah, I'm looking for a, a van, you know, the Ford um, transit, something I like. They don't have any Ford Transit. So they can be like, well, have you heard? Have you considered the Honda Odyssey? It's like, well, that doesn't have enough seats for me. It's like, yes, but you can, you know, hide your kids, kids in the trunk. Laps. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, as long as cops so, don't see, 
Yeah. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> so in terms of what uh, turned you off, was it the fact that he didn't disclose that he had a special relationship with Mercedes and that he was going to get no. a better commission or what? No. So actually it, it was, uh, it had nothing to do with the fact that he, so I, I think that people, especially publishers overblow far overblow. They're like, people say things like full disclosure. I have a market or a, a board game business. Like to everyone listening to this podcast, full disclosure, I want you to use us for marketing services. Like, are you guys, uh, now, you know, is it, is it now fair? Uh, fair play, like, or did that really not matter at all? Like, you guys know that we're a marketing company and that we want to, um, you know, market your games and and that kind of thing. But um, it's it's not about that at all. It's that if let's say if somebody if if somebody came to me and they were like, hey, you know, I'm using um, Launch Boom and or using like Backer Kit Marketing or GameFound is giving me thirty thousand dollars to do whatever I want uh, with it when you know when I launch my my game because they really wanted my account real conversation I had uh, this week. Um, and I'm like, well, pff, you shouldn't, you shouldn't go with game found marketing. You should go with me. I'm a much better marketer. $30,000 isn't much when you consider the bigger picture, you know, that that's like a little snake oily. Um, but I'm like, Hey, you know, I, I do marketing services and I would love to take on that account. And they're like, Oh, you know, I actually game found, offered us this huge incentive is like, wow, that's a really great incentive. I, yeah, you should I jump on not, that. <laughs> yeah, you should jump on that. That's the only right thing to say. And anything mm-hmm. else would be selfish, you know? So I find that when I, you know, when, when you can genuinely have somebody else's best interest at heart um, and you, you know, you're like, how can I help this person? That is mm. the, I think one of the hallmarks of a good salesperson. Um, maybe not the, um, the, you know, I, I guess an ethical salesperson, you know, and I think that it's important if, if you do your job well and you, um, you hustle and, and everything and you do a good job for people over time. I mean, that's going to, that's going to reward you. Um, you do not need to twist people's arm to get them to buy your product. They will. And maybe they'll be very dissatisfied. In fact, it's a really common thing in, in, in car dealerships when somebody buys like a sports car with the, the, you know, the convertible top and everything. I don't think they have any of those in Ireland, but no, no, um, they do. Some people, oh, they do. some people, I bet everyone's them. very like, dissatisfied. They, they use them like twice a year, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm so happy. So it's right like now. that stupid them. salesperson convinced me to buy this car and it's freezing cold. And like, yeah. So I, buyer dissatisfaction is very, very, or buyer remorse. That's what it is. It's very, very common with cars. Um, you don't want people to be remorseful that they bought your product. So like, you know, as a kind of a last point for, you know, when somebody buys deliverance that you know, there was this one person on Amazon that bought deliverance for as a Christmas present and they opened it and everything and they returned it because it was too complicated. It was like, dude, that's not a valid reason to return anything. You know, there are, there are also people that will return Christmas trees after Christmas is over and <laughs> you know, like to home Depot, that's like a thing that happens. But um, for me, you know, it's, it's, is it really a massive deal that this person was had by remorse and, and am I really going to stick it to them and say, well, you knew what you were doing when you bought this. Um, or am I just going to, you know, it's a hundred dollars in, in the grand scheme of things, that's nothing. And, uh, I'll sell that game to someone else, you know, but, um, it's, uh, it's just one of those things that you have to, you, when when you sell stuff, you that's an opportunity to upsell, to Andrew. Happy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> ah, you could buy the simple expansion. How about you uh, jump on a call with me? You know, we have a con- consultation. I'll teach you how to play. <laughs> yeah, seriously, like the games on tabletop simulator. You know, so anyway, yeah, it's uh, it's it's something that I think if you can help people get what they want, uh, you'll get you what you want to. The, in fact, I think a famous person said probably probably me. Um, you know, but if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. Andrew, 2024. Sounds like something Gandhi would say. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I think, I think one of the famous salespeople from like Zig Ziglar or whatever said that. Okay. So anyway, to take your word. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, hopefully this podcast has been helpful to you guys and, um, has opened your eyes a little bit to the difference between advertising and critical thinking or marketing. Um, and, um, you know, go out and, and make a bunch of money. Uh, Robot Richard, send us out. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's episode of Crowdfunding Nerds. 
For more resources, articles, and to listen to past podcasts, please visit us at crowdfundingnerds.com. And if you have a crowdfunding question, we also have a page on our site where you can send a message directly to us. Please visit crowdfundingnerds.com forward slash question. And if your question is a great question, we may include it in a future podcast. Thank you all again for listening to this week's episode, and we'll see you next week. Stay nerdy. Stay nerdy.